Welcome all, uh, Bonte. Uh, it's so good to have you with us. Uh, welcome everyone to another Clear Mountain interview. Today we're lucky enough to have Bonte Gunaratna, Bonte G, with us, um, and this is such a special opportunity, Bonte. This is the first time I've gotten to speak with you, um, and I'm I'm so grateful. So thank you for taking the time. Yeah. Um, Bante Henapola Gunaratna Mahatera, an internationally recognized author and meditation teacher, is the founding abbot of the Bhavana Society Buddhist Monastery in West Virginia. Born in rural Sri Lanka in 1927, he embraced monastic life at the age of 12 and has now spent 82 or maybe 83 Bante years. No, my age? No, how many years have you been in robes since being a novice? Oh, maybe uh 83 83 years yeah, as a monastic yeah making him a, remic a remarkable are you 94 now bonte 95 95 years yeah. old affectionately known as bonte g by his students he arrived in the united states in 1968 teaching at the buddhist vihara of washington dc serving as president and later becoming a buddhist chaplain and earning a phd at american university Bhanteji has taught at various meditation centers and monastery, monasteries worldwide and is renowned for his best-selling books, including Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness, The Path of Serenity Insight, Beyond Mindfulness in Plain English, and Mindfulness in Plain English, and several other books in Plain English as well. While Bhanteji continues to write and teach at the Bhavana Society, he made the decision to not accept long-distance travel invitations after his 90th birthday. Bonte, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah. Well, um, Bonte, we've had one interview with you before, uh, and in that interview, you um, spoke about, you quoted Pali suttas in their original Pali, uh, just completely fluently. And I know that as a young monk, you had a photographic memory and likely have a similar similar grasp at the moment. So. I'm wondering, from this fluent grasp of, of Pali, um, what do you feel from you've, you've gained from this intimate knowledge of the language and from kind of soaking it in all these years? Um, what do we lose from hearing the teachings and translation that you've intuited from, from knowing the Pali all these, all these years? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And since we, we learn Pali, from our childhood, even before I knew a single alphabet, I knew some Pali Sutras by heart, like Mahasatipatthana Sutta, because our parents uh, took eight precepts on full moon days, new moon days, and uh, recited these sutras. And as children, we listened to them. And it just, uh, stuck in our mind. Mm -hmm. Since then, Pali became like our mother tongue. Mm -hmm. So, and we feel very comfortable with Pali. In fact, when I uh, give Dhamma talks, uh, I like to cite Pali words, uh, passages, stanzas, sometimes full sutras, I like to recite uh, to substantiate my talk as I feel more comfortable with Pali than any translation. Mm. When you try, Pali is a very rich language. Each word has deep meaning. Mm. And these meanings, nuance, you cannot express in any other language. Uh, it's like idioms. Mm. So uh, when we read Pali and uh, think the meaning in, as this is mentioned in Pali, we think of the meaning. Meaning becomes very clear to us, but even we cannot express them in uh, in uh, to give the 
complete full meaning in any other language and therefore I feel very comfortable although I had a photographic memory uh, when I was 20 I had a sickness I lost all of it and then I rebuilt from uh, from scratch through the practice of meditation so I'm so glad that it came back to me even though I don't have photographic memory and still I feel very comfortable with Pali language yes <clears throat> Bhante, what was the illness and how did you rebuild from scratch? I rebuilt through the practice of meditation. I started meditation when I was, uh, when I lost my memory at the age of 20, maybe at the age of 21, uh, I began to regain my memory little by little uh, because I went on meditating uh, in the evening, at night, early morning, uh, whenever I had time in the daytime, uh, I meditated and there, then uh, my memory, I was able to recognize letters, words and read uh, even my mother tongue. I forgot even to read my mother tongue, Sinhalese. By then I had learned four languages, Sinhalese, Pali, Sanskrit and Tamil. But I forgot the alphabet of all these languages when I lost my memory. But at the age of 21, when I started practicing meditation, all of it came back very slowly. And then after that I continue my studies and uh, what I have achieved as, um, you know, academician was after I regained my uh, memory. Bonte, one of the words which <clears throat> I find moderns struggle with a great deal is the word chitta. <clears throat> you spoke about the nuances that the Pali language has. How would you talk about what the chitta is? It has uh, many meanings. One meaning is uh, variety, chitra. Other meaning is picture. Uh, other meaning is uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, the source, source of uh, all our uh, thoughts, words, and deeds. And uh, uh, therefore, the chitta has uh, uh, many meanings. The Buddha used the chitta, mano, vijnana as synonyms in, in Sangyutta Nikaya. Chitta ngiti, mano ngiti, vijnana ngiti, puchati, he said. That means he lined up all these words in one sentence as synonyms. Uh, when we, uh, when the mind can do a variety of things, therefore it is called chitta. Mano is the way, one, mano is the, the thinking, thinking capacity. Uh, Vinyana means uh, uh, becoming aware and that is the most commonly used word like chakkuncha, rupecha, patichu, pati, chakku vinyanang and even in uh, Mahatanna Sankhya Sutta in Madhyamnikaya Venerable Sati had a misunderstanding of about uh, vinyana and he thought the same vinyana moves on from life to life. Even in uh, um, dependent origination, the word vijnana is used. Uh, various places the word vijnana is used more often than manu and chitta. Uh, 
and therefore that is a very common word. Since it has a variety of a variety of things that vijnana can do. Bhante, another word which perhaps is the most confusing or, or um, well, difficult ones to, to wrap the mind around for, for most of us is, is Nibbana itself. Um, I know the Buddha defines it in a negative sense as the absence of greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, at the same time, I know that various teachers have tried to point to or circle around some some way of fleshing out what that might be without conceptualizing it too much. Um, I know one teacher who even said that if one was to investigate the idea of God to the very end, they might come to Nibbana. Um, and I know there is one passage in the Sutta which might um, equate Nibbana with consciousness that lands on nothing, uh, Vinyana Anidasana. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on how one should think about or not think about uh, Nibbana, enlightenment. Now, as long as we have not attained Nibbana, we will come up with all kind of interpretation. Nibbana is something to be realized, not to be talked, discussed, and right and so forth. More we discuss, more we write, more we have uh, words, we confuse the, the very nature of Nibbana. You are right, Buddha said, the absence of all this called Nibbana. Raga ke, dosa ke, moha ke, and so forth. The absence of greed, hatred, and delusion is Nibbana. Just imagine when there is no greed, what is there? Greedlessness, what does greedlessness mean? What does it mean that there is no hatred? When there is no confusion, no ignorance, what is there? We can say when there is no ignorance, we have wisdom. What is wisdom? And so forth, we can keep asking questions again and again uh, of Nibbana. I think that is why the Buddha said uh, this Nibbana is to be realized, Satchikatab. Satchikatab. Satchikatab means uh, personally realized. Once you realize, you understand how uh, wordless it is. We use words to describe something that can be perceived through our senses. Nibbana is not something that we can perceive through our senses. It is just pure eternal peace. If you put your finger on it and say, this is to say God, people say God, Nibbana. That is totally uh, wrong because God concept is one thing. They have various ways of describing it. Nibbana you cannot describe like that. You cannot write about it. We do write uh, to uh, indicate to us Nibbana. Nibbana is something to be attained, realized, and not something uh, perceptible. In other words, it is this inexpressible peace. Bhante, thank you. Do you feel like people are still attaining Nibbana in this day and age now? People tr trying to attain Nibbana? Are, they, are there people who are attaining, who are, are there Arahants right now in the world? I strongly believe that there are uh, enlightened persons 
attained certain stages of enlightenment. Some are really enlightened, but they don't go out and uh, propagate and do some propaganda. They are the ones who are real uh, enlightened persons. Those who speak about the attainment, by that very fact they are not attained enlightenment. If you attain enlightenment, you keep it to yourself. It is 100% personal thing. When you try to explain, other people can easily misunderstand you. And therefore it is better to express it through your behavior, through your talk, words and deeds, in public as well as in private. No secret, one who attains enlightenment, doesn't have any secret because there is nothing to hide in him. And therefore, his expression is uh, matching with his thinking and behavior. And Buddha gave a very uh, beautiful uh, advice in uh, Madhyamanikaya, uh, those who do not have the power to read others' mind can observe enlightened person using his eyes and ears. By observing his behavior through his eyes, and listening to what he says, through these two things, Buddha, you can investigate uh, other person. Buddha asked the monks to observe him. And that is what the Brahma Ayu's disciple called Purana. Brahma Ayu was 120 years old. He heard about the Buddha. He sent his uh, a disciple called Purana to observe the behavior of the Buddha. And uh, Purana went and spent seven months with the Buddha, following him like his own shadow, and then concluded that yes, is, he is fully enlightened. And in the Buddha's case, uh, he is declared to the world in the first sermon when he realized the Four Noble Truth in twelve modes uh, and three aspects. Tiparivattan dvada sakaran yatha bhutan yana dasanan suvi When his uh, realization of the Four Noble Truth was perfected in three modes and twelve aspects. He declared that because he wanted to uh, eliminate the doubt of the five monks in order to build up confidence in him and listen to him. And otherwise other monks who have attained enlightenment declared only to the Buddha. When Buddha asked, they declared only to the Buddha. They didn't go out uh, to the to the public and say that I am enlightened, I am enlightened, and so forth. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Bonte. Uh, Bonte, the goal of enlightenment um, it seems so lofty. Um, I know that the Buddha uh, said, and, and many did, that stream entry, the first stage of awakening, is something all should aim for and is a goal that um, both lay people and monks and nuns can can achieve. What would your advice or, or encouragement be to a lay person in modern America with maybe a family uh, and children? Um, can 
how should they orient themselves to to think about stream entry, to the first stage of awakening? How should they practice? I think that's also a good question. I think there are many sincere people who really want to attain stream entry, and some of them find ways to practice Dhamma, the, to, to find good friends, listening to Dhamma, remembering Dhamma, following the advice given in the Dhamma, and uh, meditate. Without meditation, especially Samatha Vipassana meditation, meditation of mindfulness meditation, they cannot attain stream entry. And therefore there are many people, lay people, you might have noticed, coming to monastery, going to many retreats, uh, Vipassana retreat and practicing. I think they are very sincere. Uh, I noticed some of them uh, practice so sincerely, they certainly can attain stream entry in this very life. And Buddha said you can attain stream entry either at the early age of your life or in the middle of middle age of life or even at the moment of death you can attain stream entry uh, if you follow the instructions very meticulously according to the Buddha's instructions. Now, if somebody has any doubt uh, of attaining stream entry, the person must seek a good friend, Kalyanamitta, and learn the Dhamma and investigate the Dhamma, practice the factors of enlightenment. I think people are trying to do that. People are trying to practice mindfulness, they try to investigate, they make effort, they practice tranquility, they gain concentration and, and so forth. Uh, I think there are people I think even in the modern society. You know, when people keep enjoying <coughs> for a certain period of time, they get they they come to a realization this enjoyment itself is suffering. So much to do to enjoy and they get tired of it and they give, they give it up. I know uh, in February, with this example, February uh, people in Brazil have a carnival. So they world famous carnivals. And during that time, there are many, many people who hate carnival. They don't want to see carnival and they organize retreat. And I have been there many, many, many times during February and spent almost a month or two uh, going to various places, teaching meditation. And I see the pleasure comes to a, a point that people get tired of it. You know, you see the Bodhisattva's life when he was a lay person, he went to the extreme pleasure. And finally what happened? He got so tired of it. It is just like when you eat something very delicious. You get tired of it. That is what is called diminishing return. <laughs> diminishing return. So when you, when you come to that level, you d don't want to enjoy anymore. You turn completely back to enjoyment. And these are the people who really seriously want to attain stream entry. I think there are many people, even any country. 
I believe there are people who sincerely want to do that. Bonte, would that be your definition of maybe not, you know, the, the two types of preliminary to stream entry, the faith follower and I think the wisdom follower who the Buddha says that they aren't yet stream enterers, but they're destined for stream entry. What are your interpretation of those two, those two terms are, because it seems like they, they are destined for stream entry eventually, but they aren't yet there. Yeah. Uh, faith followers are those who listen to them and uh, investigate the meaning of what they hear and then they build up uh, deep faith. They are all uh, uh, faith followers. Their faith is uh, endowed with knowledge. That is called avicca prasad. Avicca means uh, having known. The avicca word avicca comes from the root with, with to know. Having known, having understood the Dhamma, they build up faith, not blind faith. They are in the spiritual faculties, Sadha, Virya, Sadha, Samadhi, Panya. They are they are more, they have more faith than any other spiritual faculties. And they are the ones who, when they learn the Dhamma, uh, will have a very rich knowledge of Dhamma and they base their uh, practice on faith. They are faith followers. Dhamma, uh, Wisdom followers are practicing the wisdom faculty more than others. And um, faith followers also uh, are struggling to be harder than others uh, because they are called uh, Danda Patipada, Danda Bhijna. They are Practice is sluggish, attainment is sluggish. Because of their faith is so deep and they want to follow all the rules and regulations and out of faith and therefore they, you know, following all the minute rules and regulations is not very easy. That's very difficult. And they follow it. They follow it with uh, trusting the Buddha, uh, trusting themselves, trusting the Dhamma. And then their practice is called sluggish, slow, and yet they attain it. Bhante, how would one know if one had attained stream entry? Of course, the person himself or herself knows one thing, the person actually doesn't appreciate others praising him. You feel very embarrassed to hear people talk very highly of you. They may do so with sincere heart, but it, but it is uh, sort of an embarrassment for them to hear because they are ego is not playing major role in their life. That is one sign. The second is, he sincerely does not think that uh, you can attain extreme entry by following regular rituals. There are many, many kinds of rituals Perhaps they might, uh, in, when they live in a community, in order to go along with the community, communal activities, he might join the rituals that others perform. But in his heart he knows this ritual itself does not lead him or her to attain liberation. This is mere ritual. And that, why, that is second reason he the second way that he knows that he's in the stream entry. 
and uh, third is he has no doubt whatsoever of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, morality, the, this world, next world, mother, father, all kind of things that people have doubt, that person doesn't have any doubt. You know, these days, these days some people question about the rebirth. They question, they ask whether the rebirth is just uh, another notion Buddha borrowed from Hinduism and so forth. No, I strongly object that because the, the dependent origination, Buddha said many a birth, at the end of dependent origination, he said many a birth I wandered in samsara seeking but not finding the builder of this house. Sorrowful is to be born again and again. O house builder, thou art seen, thou shalt not build this house again. Thy rich pole is shattered, thy uh, rafter is broken, thou cannot build this house anymore. The mind has attained the end of repetition of birth and death. In this, it, it, it is said, Aneka jati samsaram, sandhavisam, anibhisam, gahakara kangavesam, tu dukkha jati punapuna, gahakara gadehtosi, punage annakasi, sabbate pasuka bhagga, gahakutang visankhitang, visankhara gatan chittan, tannanang kai majjika. Like that he said in Pali. That means this house builder, the carpenter, builder of this house, is completely destroyed. You cannot build this house. What is this uh, house, the, the carpenter or the builder? This builder is craving, desire. As long as you have a desire and you die with desire, you definitely, whether you like it or not, will be born somewhere. You will be born somewhere. So long as you have desire, it combines with ignorance, avijja, tanna avijja. These two exist. Uh, as long as these two exist, you will be reborn whether you like it or not. And therefore, a person who attained the stream entry has no doubt whatsoever because that person also has certain degree of desire and uh, ignorance. That is why he ended up in extreme entry. Of course, his uh, uh, sansaric existence is limited. Only that person can have, have confidence that he is near to somebody parayano. He is uh, definitely leading the end uh, of uh, leading to the attainment of somebody uh, enlightenment, and therefore. These are the three factors, as you know, three fetters, three fetters. He destroys, he doesn't do it at once. He will destroy them one by one, slowly and gradually, through his maturity of his wisdom, insight, understanding. When this grow, mature, then only know that he knows that he has a stream entry. Sometimes people ask me, some people uh, come to and uh, come to me and ask me, Bhante, so and so said that I am a stream enterer. Am I a stream enterer? I said no. I said no. <laughs> Why not? The person gets upset. Why not? Because a stream enterer doesn't have to ask somebody else whether he attends stream entry or not. <laughs> <laughs> he is the self, what you call, testimony. And uh, he knows that, he or she, and he, through that person's behavior, some wise people who know Dhamma can uh, understand that this person has some distinction, some kind of attainment, even though the person does not express it in words, people 
recognize that he has something special. Bonte, thank you. Um, you bring up this uh, aspect of right view around there's this world and the next. There are spontaneously reborn beings, there is rebirth. And the lack of that view as a an accepted one in the West, I think there's a few sort of ripple effects, which I'd be curious about your thoughts on. Um, one is that uh, the idea of dedicating merit to the dead is almost non-existent in our culture. And I, I remember being at another monastery where uh, someone came and spoke about these dreams she had of her recently passed mother, sort of uh, shivering and hungry, coming to her asking for clothing and food. Um, so I. So I, there's that aspect of dedicating merit to the dead. Um, and then the other one is, it strikes me that in Buddhist cultures and countries, there's almost a bit, in a certain sense, less pressure because of the idea that there's multiple lifetimes. And I know some, some people actually have the bodhisattva aspiration or the idea of remaining for a few lifetimes to do good. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on both of those aspects, one on the importance um, of dedicating merit to the dead, and the second on what is your th what are your thoughts on the bodhisattva path? I see. We must say that uh, uh, in uh, original Buddhism, the Bodhisattva is not something strange, something alien. Buddha himself mentioned many, many, many times, because before I attained enlightenment, I was Bodhisattva. When I was Bodhisattva, you see in Bhairava uh, Sutta and various other suttas, Buddha said, when I was Bodhisattva, I was such and such. Somebody who is uh, destined to attain enlightenment is Bodhisattva. That is Bodhisattva. So the, it is, you don't have to uh, do uh, something different from what we are doing everyday life to attain liberation. If you practice meditation to attain, gain uh, insight, to attain uh, stream entry, you are Bodhisattva. In that sense, everybody who is trying to attain liberation is a bodhisattva. I mean, there is no question about it. Of course, later on, in uh, some other traditions, they specialized this and they began to promote it uh, in various in various ways. Uh, these are, uh, I think, in my view, not necessary. We all are bodhisattvas. And the second is transferring merit. We know there is only one, according to the Buddha in Thirokuddha Sutta, there is only one uh, realm of existence where the merit that we uh, try to transfer, uh, receive, only one place. That is called para dat tu pajivi, one uh, ghostly existence. The para dat upajivi means living on the basis of what is given to them by others. Para means others, Dattva means given, Upajiva means living. Paradattva Upajiva. Paradattva Upajiva we can use for even Buddhist monks <laughs> because we, we, are li we live dependent on what people give us. <laughs> Similarly, there are beings who, after death, uh, they are in a certain uh, state for a certain period of time. It's a sort of limbo state. And in that state, when they are there, 
especially in Tirokuta Sutta Kuddika Nikai, it is mentioned that they are waiting to receive some merits from the living relatives. Once they receive the merits, how they receive merits, this is the thing. That suppose you do some meritorious deed. You can give opadana, you practice meditation, you give observe your moral principles and you pay respect to the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and do any of these things, all of them. And then you think yourself, may this marriage accrue unto so and so. And they, since they are living in a temporary, uh, what you call space, uh, uh, lifespan, life, uh, they hear this and they become happy that you have not forgotten them. It is how we transfer marriage, otherwise there is no any way uh, like, uh, you know, why transfer in money or put in something in one bank account and another. Not like that. Suppose, I give you another example. Suppose uh, you are driving, you see a little kitten on the road, so you stop the vehicle, get out and pick up the kitten and either you bring it home or put it out on the sidewalk so that he can be safe and you drive. Having done all these things, on one of them, uh, you come to me and said, Bhante, when I was driving, I saw a kitten, I did such and such and such and such. Then I said, very good, that's very good. So I rejoice in what you have done. You have done something good, and you tell me, then I will be happy. Similarly, when you do something wholesome, and wish them to share your pleasure, when you do something wholesome, your, your heart is filled with joy, happiness, that you have done something, just like that kitten. You do it with pleasure, compassion, kindness, and your heart is full of that pleasure. And you share it with me. I am also happy. Exactly like that, we do something wholesome, and then we must understand there are 31 planes of existence. These are all mentioned in Buddhist cosmology. It is, I, I mentioned in my mind, in my path of certainty and insight, all the 31 I have mentioned. You can find them all in Buddhist texts. So, therefore, this uh, Peta life is one of those 31 planes of existence. And therefore, they, uh, they, they after receiving their uh, they, after they become uh, happy and rejoicing with them, they would be reborn in a better place because they, they became happy. When they are in that uh, life, they are very unhappy. And you made them happy, and then they will be reborn in a better place. Thank you, Ponte. Uh, yeah. I know we're uh, coming closer to the end of your time, but it, may I ask a few more questions of you? One thing. Okay. On this note of uh, of death, um, this is a slight diversion, but it's one that I I know some people are struggling with. I uh, what if someone has a pet um, who seems to be suffering a great deal, and uh, sort of the doctors and vets around them are encouraging them to to euthanize the pet. Um, how should they navigate that moment in, in their and in the pet's life? Um, say the pet has cancer or something of that nature. Uh, you, could you repeat this question? You um, mentioned euthanizing. Yeah, so say someone has a pet like, like a kitten or a cat or a dog and they're quite ill um, right. and at the end of their life and in pain um, and they're being encouraged to put the pet down to euthanize them by most of society 
um, but they also want to keep the first precept. Do you have any advice for navigating that yes, moment? I think we, we have that experience. We had the, uh, several cats. They were very, very sick. And when we took them to the vet, uh, they said they want to put him to sleep. We said, no, you give some morphine. They gave us morphine uh, pills. So what we did was we brought them, uh, one of our monks uh, crushed this morphine pills and uh, got that uh, little, you know, this tube you used to put eye drops. Uh, he took one of them and mixed it with water, these pills. And when the cat was uh, meowing in pain, he sat with him, holding it near his mouth. As soon as the mo uh, cat opened his mouth to say meow, he put this in and pressed. And then this liquid with the morphine goes right into his uh, heart. Then his pain disappears. Until he died, on his own, he went on doing that. We refused to let the doctor euthanize. We had a dog. Uh, one time when, during a retreat, she was very sick. Uh, we did not raise the dog, but somebody's dog came and uh, started living here, so we fed and so forth. So it happens to be like our dog. So when she was sick, he took to the veterinarian. He, he tried to do that. I said, no, you let him be in the uh, clinic for one night. If she doesn't die by herself, uh, we will come and get him. So that night she did not die. We brought back and we kept him. And also we treated her like that. And again, she fell ill. Again, when we took him to, took her to the doctor, and uh, he said, again, he want to euthanize. We said, no. And uh, we, I told them the same thing. You keep her one night. If she doesn't die, we come and get. That night she died on her own. So we must understand, even though someone, animal or human and so on, wants to live. Everyone wants to live even a minute, extend their life. Everyone is fear of death. Everyone has fear of death. And everyone uh, will be uh, glad to live even, extend life even for two minutes. So we must allow that. So we, we actually honestly believe in a right to live, <laughs> right to live. And therefore, euthanasia, you know, sometimes they extend this uh, idea not only to animals, but in some cases we heard some people want to do it to human beings as well. So where you would end up? When children have, children find their parents, very, very, very sick, extremely difficult to take care of them. Are they going to do, are they going to euthanize their parents? No. Monte, with, this is really strikes home and it, it's always struck me that for a pet, um, you know, the, uh, the chance to be cared for by a human is such a rare thing in, in samsara that even those last few days might be really powerful to that being's karma um, to be cared for. And that pain sometimes allows a pet to let go more. I know that pets I've had have simply stopped eating at some point. Um, so that's, uh, thank you for your reflections on, on all that, Bonte. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and, and Bonte, I, I know we've kept you for quite a while, but uh, one, one final question is, um, do you have any advice for um, us here in Seattle, young, the new, the younger generation of monastics in the U.S. 
what advice would you give us? What should we, what should we um, be thinking about? I think uh, it's a very, very good question, or rather uh, request. Um, you are Nisabo? Yes. Yes. Uh, how, how many verses do you have? Just 10, Monte. 10 verses. Okay, Asma Nisabo. Uh, becoming a monk is a very, very rare thing. Everybody doesn't like to become monk, to get their parents' permission and find a suitable place and so forth, very difficult. Having got that opportunity, having got the permission from parents, finding a suitable place, if one becomes a monk or nun, that person must be very, very thankful to his own life. That is the blossom of his life. That is because that is the best thing one can do in one's life. And therefore, but not too many people like to become monks and nuns. Once you become a nun, monk or nun, then you must uh, use every ounce of your energy your wisdom, determination to stick to that life. Because this is very not very easy thing. Not very easy. Once you got into that you have the world, the the world the, the earth, what you call the sky is the limit. You have total freedom to practice meditation. You know people these days when we ask people to meditate they always come up with excuses not to meditate. I have to do this, 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 this. I have job, my children, my bank account, my bank loan and mortgage, this and that. So many excuses they have as lay people. Once you got out of that trap, you are trapped in lay life. Once you got out of that trap, don't go back to the same trap. Stay out of it and continue your practice. Becoming a <clears throat> monk is a very difficult thing. Once you committed to monk's life, you must stay there. That's why Buddha said, Arabhata Nikhamata Yunjata Buddha Sasane Dunata Machuno Sayang Nalangarang Kunjarang. Arabata, you start. With difficulties, you start. Nikkamata, continue. Aramba is called Aramba Dhatu. Aramba Dhatu, elements of beginning. Nikkamata, Nikkamadhatu. That means proceeding. Once you start something, you know. After while your initial enthusiasm will slowly dwindle, dwindle down, then you become lazy and so forth. Not doing that, you must continue your initial uh, enthusiasm. Build up your momentum. Do not the Destroy the retinue of Mara. Mara Sami, just like an elephant crush a bamboo house. Nalagaram Kunjara. Nalagara means bamboo house. Kunjara means elephant. You must be like an elephant to destroy the army of Mara. It is the army of Mara that tries to pull you out of your uh, monastic life. There are so much temptations outside. You can see all kinds of beautiful things, beautiful people, beautiful girls, beautiful this and that. These are just uh, uh, what you call uh, ma the, the baits of Mara. Mm -hmm. Mara gives you these baits and you swallow. And that is why it is called Gullible. Mm -hmm. Gullible 
it's a good Pali word. Pali word is gali bali so. Gali bali so. Gali means swallow. Bali so means bait. One who just naively swallow everything and become a become a bait of Mara. Putting in, getting into the Mara's trap. Once you become a monk, you must remember this, not to give it up. But the, but the, the Asati monk, Posan, Mutto Bandhana Meva Jayati. Vanamutto Vanameva Dhati. You just uh, came out of uh, jungle and feel that you are safe, but again you go back to the jungle. That is a very foolish thing. So I very strongly, because I have lived the monk's life for 80, uh, 83 years. 83 years. And I knew, I can see the difference between my life and my family members' lives. Mm. I have so many uh, brothers, sisters, you know, uh, nephews, nieces, grand nephews, grand nieces, great grand nieces. Grand, I see all of them, five generations people of my life, family. I can see the way how they live and how I live. And because I made the commitment to stay in the monk's life, I it, it is not very easy. There are so many obstacles, so many impediments, so much temptations, and we must learn to face all of them, and then we become hero. We all become heroes. I ask young monks all to be, become a very good heroes. One day I will keep those words with me. And it's such an honor to actually get to speak with you. I don't know if I've ever talked to a monk who's had this many years in robes. And thank you. Thank you, really. Thank you. I wish you continue your monastic life. I wish you never disrobe and you stay in monastic life until you die. Okay? Thank you, Vante. And I hope you, you, uh, your health continues to be wonderful, and I hope you continue to bless us for many years to come, Vante. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Eh? Yeah, bye.